Hi, I'm Stacia Walmsley, host of today's episode of the Providence College podcast. I'm very excited to welcome cognitive scientist and Yale professor Lori Santos back to Providence College. Dr. Santos is host of the wildly popular The Happiness Lab, which is based on her college course called Psychology and the Good Life. It focuses on the science of happiness. Many of you may remember her as an honorary degree recipient and the commencement speaker for the class of 2021's commencement exercises. Here's a clip of her and her speech in May of that year. Providence College seniors, there are so many unthanked people who have been on this journey with you. And whether it's obvious or not, their names are gonna be on that paper right beside yours in invisible ink. But the beauty of gratitude is that we can make what's invisible visible. And so I want you to do that now. I want you to stand up and let all of those invisible names on that diploma know that you are grateful. They're all back there and around, so stand up and give them some love. So welcome back to Providence College, Laurie. We're really happy to have you back on campus. It's been so nice to be back already. Terrific. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you remember from the last time you were here. When you, it was about two years ago, you were on campus for our commencement exercises for the class of 2021. Um, and as you'll remember, that class had really been thrown a curveball. Um, they had their senior year completely upended by COVID and um, you came to campus and you really infused the whole ceremony and gave them a little bit of a background in gratitude and happiness. And then you introduced this really lovely moment of gratitude where they were able to um, thank those who made it possible for them to be in that that moment, a moment that they maybe were feeling um, some you know, confused feelings about because of COVID. But I'm wondering what you remember about that particular time two years ago. And then also, um, if you have any specific memories of your time here at PC. Yeah, I mean, you know, mostly, I just remember like the utter uncertainty, right? You know, was going to be outside? Is it really going (laughs) to happen? Like, you know, I think everyone was so hopeful that they could pull it off and give something special back to the class of 2021. And I think in the end, they were really able to do that, right? I think we learned that, you know, with some grace and patience, we can pivot a little bit, you know, we can try new things. But yeah, I think this importance of taking time to be grateful, even when we feel like we shouldn't be grateful, when we feel like we're dealing with hassles, we're dealing with things that are kind of a pain in the butt, right, you know, that we don't want to deal with. And so I think reminding the students then that there was still such tremendous things to be grateful for, even in the midst of all these hassles, even in the midst of all these changes, um, it was something that was exciting. I do remember we got the perfect spring day. I think when we moved outside, it was like, is it going to downpour? Is it? But no, it was just, you know, somehow like, you know, the deities, the gods, like looked down and said, no, Providence College will have everything, you know. It needs. And so beautiful, beautiful spring day, and just, you know, such a lovely event to see students, you know, celebrating and kind of getting together, you know, mostly because we were outside, no masks, right? And right, so right. I think it was just a really special moment. I was so happy I could be here on campus for it. I, I definitely myself will never forget it and I know members of that that class won't um, it was a very special day um, so it was a couple of years ago I'm wondering if you would remind our listeners a little bit about the type of research that you do your work and um, specifically what uh, what do we mean when we say the science of happiness and, and what you study yeah so um, mostly I'm just really interested in you know what kinds of practices can we do to feel better right to improve our well-being over time And I take a really evidence-based approach to that. Um, There's this big field right now of positive psychology, Mm -hmm. um, which is all the kind of studies that really look at the kinds of things we can do to improve our well-being over time. I got interested in this when I took on a new role on Yale's campus. I'm a professor at Yale. um, And I became uh, head of college on campus, which means I live on campus with students. I kind of, you know, see student life up close and personal. Mm -hmm. And, And even before COVID, I really started worrying about what we were seeing with our students. You know, we have a mental health crisis nationally where over 40% of college students
students report being too depressed to function. You know, over 60% report feeling overwhelmingly anxious. You know, I was just seeing this in the trenches in my students. And so I decided to develop a new class and sort of retrain in this field of positive psychology so I could figure out, okay, what are some practical strategies I can teach my students on campus that they can use to kind of feel better? Um, and the class I developed sort of went a little bit viral on campus. I think it went a little bit viral off campus. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I was really able to, you know, harness these strategies that the research shows and share them not just with my students on campus at Yale, but but beyond. And I think it's one of the reasons I wound up here, you know, for my commencement speech at Providence College, too. And that class started prior to the pandemic, correct? Correct. Yeah. The first time I taught it was in 2018. Um, and it would, when it feels like it was kind of prescient to be thinking about mental health and all these problems, right? I think we had just no clue what, what we were in for, you know, these multiple years of, you know, not having the social connection we had before, just utter uncertainty, anxiety, a lot of loss, a lot of grief, um, both for the traditions that we missed, but also for the people that we lost. I think we just had, you know, no idea what we were going to be up against. So in your students and then also in people that you talk to, um, what's What's different about studying the science of happiness post-pandemic um, versus the versus the work you were doing before? Yeah, I mean, I think we've realized just how acute the mental health crisis was before because it's gotten so much worse on campus. I think two years of anxiety of not being able to see easily the people we care about, you know, things have gotten worse. And I think our students are struggling even more. The kind of, we, we saw a lot of loneliness before the pandemic, but these things have gotten worse as students spent, you know, three years in Zoom school and in many cases, right? They're trying to kind of play catch up on a lot of these practices and strategies that they know can improve their well-being mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's become even more acute that we need some of these lessons now more than ever yeah I, I've been listening um, recently to the the most recent season of the happiness happiness lad podcast and you have um, been mentioning a concept that I've been pretty intrigued by um, called post-traumatic Growth. Is that, mm -hmm. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that is and how maybe that is applicable to this time? And is that an emerging area of research? Or? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think everyone's heard of probably post-traumatic stress, right? PTSD, mm -hmm. right? This is the kind of um, situation that when you go through some traumatic event, whether it's combat or some sort of trauma in your personal life, you can wind up with these long-term kind of uh, negative effects, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're more anxious or and things like that. Um, and we think that that's kind of what happens after trauma. But if, but if you look at the research, what you find is a similar phenomenon in the opposite direction. And this is what's called post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. The idea is that after some traumatic events, sometimes you wind up finding more meaning in your life. You wind up strengthening social connections. You wind up figuring out what really matters. You wind up gaining a sense of your own personal resilience because you're like, if I could go through that, I could sort of go through anything, right? And that leads to a host of positive psychological changes after trauma. And the reason I love this concept of post-traumatic growth is that it shows us that there's not just one path that happens if our circumstances are really bad. You know, we all can go through, you know, a terrible time like the, you know, COVID pandemic or, or a variety of terrible times that a lot of our students and a lot of people in our community face and wind up growing from it and wind up becoming stronger after the fact. There's really, there's something about um, the evidence-based, data-based approach that you take to thinking about happiness that I know I have found pretty interesting. And, you know, if somebody um, may say the kind of smile, you'll feel better or look on the bright side, those feel very much like platitudes. But the work that you're presenting in the podcast and to your students, because it's science backed, um, feels like there's uh, there there's it's more accessible to me. I don't know if you've been hearing that from other people. Um, you know, certainly a lot of people are listening in, which is great. Um, but that accessibility to science and bringing that um, out in, in, whether it's um, to your students or to others, um, what has that been like? What has that experience been like? What kind of feedback do you get? Yeah, I mean, I get exactly the feedback you mentioned a lot, right, where people you know, they, they want strategies that they can use to feel better and they don't want platitudes, right? They really want to know what does the evidence suggest? And and I think that's important, right? You know, there, there are lots of ideas out there about the kinds of things we can do to feel better. 
but we want to make sure we're putting like our energy into the right stuff. You know, we don't want to kind of put a lot of work in and find out, oh, that wasn't the thing I was supposed to do to improve my well-being. It's just not going to work. And so I think looking at the evidence, looking at what really scientifically makes us happier, what, what the evidence shows about what actual happy people are doing in terms of their behaviors and their mindsets, I think it can be really powerful. And and bringing that science to people, you know, trying to find ways to boil it down and in our podcast, often using narrative stories to explain these conversations concepts to people. Um, I think it's been incredible. I mean, I hear from people all the time about how much these these stories and the podcast episodes have really helped people, you know, in their daily life. We just did this uh, really fun live episode in, in Boston. Uh, we're, we're having this conversation in April of 2023, and we just did this live show in Boston. And it was incredible. You know, so many, like, people after the show came up to me and said, oh, because I learned, you know, this concept of, like, you know, g- contrasting my plans and make sure I think about obstacles. Like, I was able to run a marathon or you know because I I heard about the importance of fun I've really been investing in it with my girlfriends and here we are eight of us at the show together and so you just see that if you can figure out ways to put this science into practice it can actually change our lives in a big way and I understand too that you have um, been introducing some of these concepts to adolescents, teens, um, because as you were mentioning before, this mental health crisis doesn't start in college. It starts sooner, right? So how are you seeing that um, that age group respond to some of the science that you're presenting? Yeah, I mean, you know, more and more I've realized, like, you know, I wish I didn't have to teach this class on campus, right? Like, I wish people learned it earlier. And, and in one of the domains where we kept getting questions and requests for new content was uh, for high school and middle school students, right? These are students who, again, are going through a lot of the same stresses that we see see on a college campus, but but sometimes in even more acute ways, right? You know, the academic pressures they face, the social pressures they face, you know, adolescence is just a really tricky time, right? And so we really wanted to give resources to that group. And so um, we've put a new class out there called the Science of Wellbeing for Teens. Um, it's up, it was originally up on Coursera.org, which is where we put a lot of our content. But most recently we put it on YouTube too, because that's where all the high school kids are today, <laughs> on YouTube. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it's just openly, freely available to anyone who wants to take it. We've already had 70,000 learners sign up just in the first like month or so. Um, you know, the response has really been incredible when we're getting, we're starting to get reviews in, you know, as people make it through the whole course sure. content and, you know, we're just hearing, why didn't I learn this stuff earlier? This stuff is so helpful. And so I think even in that age range, uh, learning strategies that really work to feel better and, and that, that you can use to navigate stress is really important. And talking about kind of navigating and thinking about, um, the ways that this these strategies are something that you can use at all points in your life, right? Like we think about um, just thinking even of the the phrase pursuit of happiness. Um, you have mentioned on a couple of occasions in the podcast, and I know in some of the courses online that happiness is not necessarily a destination. Um, and I think that's tough for some of us who have grown up thinking that it's something you can will yourself to be or a state of being. Um, so is that, you know, one of the truisms that, or, or, um, fallacies that seems to, that people think is a truism that people need to overcome before they can even jump into this work and this kind of, this idea that they can, um, they can use these strategies to help themselves in in their journey for well-being I guess yeah I mean I think you know one of the one of the big misconceptions that we have about happiness is that it's this like destination right Um, Mm -hmm. this is actually something researchers call the arrival fallacy or I like to refer to as the happily ever after fallacy you know every Disney movie kind of led us astray (laughs) and and then they lived happily ever after right Um, but that's just not how happiness works Um, uh, my my Harvard colleague Dan Gilbert is fond of saying happily ever after only works if you have three minutes to live right you know it's like (laughs) like it's a kind of continued process. And so I think once we realize that, once we realize that happiness is a journey, it's a process, um, it can give us some real insight into how we can go about pursuing our happiness in a more effective way. Because a lot of what the work suggests is that happiness requires some effort, you know, just like other good things in life, you know, like learning to master a sport, as so many athletes here at Providence College do, right? Um, You know, getting your education, you know, raising a child, learning an instrument, right? You got to put in continued practice, right? And that's just how happiness works. You know, you're never going to get to a destination where you're done. It kind of requires constant effort and work throughout your life. There's this 
concept that we talk about a lot at Providence College, and I think it's not unusual for college campuses and this idea of flourishing. And even I think whether it's at the high school level or even the college level, um, this is kind of taken off as almost a, a students are well, like hashtag flourishing yeah. when they're doing stuff. But in as much as it um, can be said with tongue in cheek, that it is something that, you know, you talk a lot about in your work that is a key concept um, and something that, again, something you need to work at. Um, what are some of the, what's some of the evidence that you've seen maybe at the college level specifically about students who have um, made an attempt to flourish in different ways. Yeah, I mean, I think that the key is that we, we often get what truly leads to flourishing a little bit wrong, mm-hmm. right? I think sometimes we assume that flourishing is about, you know, perfect academic performance or getting the perfect job or, you know, to these high school students that I've been working with recently, getting into the perfect college, you know, getting to a college like Providence College, right? And, and those things, you know, matter for our life. But if you look at what really controls our flourishing, it's the social relationships we form. It's the good things that we do for other people. It's the kinds of mindsets we establish for ourselves, whether we're feeling grateful or whether we're feeling present, right? Those things really determine a flourishing life, which is often defined as you know having a life where you have some positive emotion, but also having a life where you have a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. You know, you're satisfied with where your life is going, and so I think we often are pursuing flourishing, but we get it you know wrong. Like you know, you'll see like you know on Instagram of like you know I'm oh I'm up all night studying, not hanging out with my friends, like hashtag flourishing, and I want to be like no, that's not you know we might need a better a better balance there. And so I think this this term is really helpful to to point us in the direction of what we might need to be going towards but we need to have an accurate view of what really leads to it sure um i was mentioning to you before we started talking that um i was uh, quite a fan of your podcast during covid and several members of my family um we would we would sit down and listen to it together and and really took away those strategies and started to apply them and i think during the pandemic specifically, there was this idea that it was, um, there was permission to start thinking about how do we um, find meaning and what's most important. Um, And now that we're in a situation where we're getting back to whatever this new normal is, um, I wonder if there's this kind of law of diminishing intent where these, um, the ways we had started thinking during the pandemic, or at least some of us did about finding meaning and making sure that we were um, strategically um, considering our well-being and how to be happy, uh, some of that's fallen away. So are there things that you're hearing from people now who are wanting to kind of reflex this happiness muscle? And what do you suggest? What are some of the tips to re-engage those, um, those kind of self-motivated actions to be happier? Yeah, I mean, I think that the collective pause that was the pandemic, you know, was, was a great moment for us to all assess, like, you know, how are things going? Am I satisfied with my life? Do I have this sense of meaning? And I think it's what's launched a lot of sociological changes that have, you know, kind of surprisingly continued to last past the pandemic, you know, these sort of conversations about about, you know, quiet quitting mm-hmm. and the great resignation and just people really kind of making some big changes in their life. Um, I think the pandemic was a transformative experience for a lot of people um, and that, that allowed them to kind of transform in, in ways that will hopefully improve their happiness. But you know, as that collective pause, you know, ends and we go back to normal, it's easy to forget the lessons that we learned during that time and sort of go back to the grind. And I think that's when it becomes even more important to think about like, you know, well, what are some of the strategies that like the research really shows we should engage in? And I think one of the ones that I think became so salient during the pandemic that we need to get back to um, is prioritizing what's called our time affluence. So this is just this kind of subjective sense that we have some free time, that we have that kind of moment and that space to pause and assess um, and a time to be kind of mindful. And I think that's not what a lot of us are experiencing, you know, especially these days post pandemic, a lot of us experience the opposite, which is what's known as time famine, where you're like famished for time. And and there's lots of evidence that time famine works in our body, like like hunger famine, right? Like it causes a a fight or flight response. It has has effects on the way our body works, but it also has big effects on our level of happiness. In fact, there's some research by the Harvard professor, Ashley Willens, that if you self-report being time famished a lot of the time, that's as bad for 
your well-being is if you self-report being unemployed. <laughs> you know, we know oh, wow. like suddenly becoming unemployed would probably negatively affect your well-being. Just feeling like you're strapped for time all the time is just as bad. And so I, I think this is a big lesson that we need to come back to, that if you felt some space, you know, during that yucky time in 2020 when we had all this free time, but if you notice that that time was really helpful, you know, there, there needs to be ways that you strategically build that back in, you know, either by scheduling objectively more free time for yourself or by finding subjective ways to open up some free time. And and one of my favorite strategies is to make good use of the time blocks that you do have, Um, you know, because we all have some free time, but, you know, when a, you know, when that meeting ends early or your kids fall asleep early or, you know, practice gets canceled or whatever, you know, we tend to just say, oh, it's, you know, this little windfall of time. I'll just check my email or go on social media or just uh, blow it off somehow. Right. But if we make good use of that, those little pieces of time, what, what researchers often call time confetti, these little sort of pieces of time floating around, we can, we can use that time confetti to do better things. You know, that's a moment where you could, you know, squeeze in a little bit of movement for your body or text a friend to be a little bit more social or, you know, engage in a meditation practice or, you know, just have a, you know, a breath to check in and see how things are going. Um, You know, so that's one of the big strategies I've thought of after COVID, you know, a big change was not having as much time as we did during the, you know, not so great periods of COVID. Um, But if we can bring that back, uh, I think we can experience the benefits that come from time affluence. So even in these short periods of time, do you have a favorite go-to in your in your kind of snippet of confetti? My own ar- happiness <laughs> arsenal, as I like yeah. to call it, because you need like arsenal as like a, a bunch of weapons um, to, to kind of fight off the not so happy time. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, when I have some free time, well, first of all, I like to make sure I'm making free time and that, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, uh, but but it's really essential. But then once you get free time, I think the key is to make sure you're trying to spend it, you know, in ways that will promote your happiness as much as possible. And one of the big ones for me is making sure I'm getting a little bit more social connection. Mm. You know, when I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed, it's really easy to like plop down and watch TV. But that's exactly the time that I need to reach out to a good friend that I haven't talked to in a long time or catch up with a college roommate or you know, really have some quality time with my husband, right? Um, I think especially when the, in the times where you feel so overwhelmed that you don't want to be social, those are the times when you actually do need to be social. Um, another thing for me that's been a big one is just making sure I'm moving my body, mm. right? You know, it's not running a marathon. It's not beating yourself up about hitting the gym. It's just like making sure your body feels good because it's moved a lot um, and that it's rested a lot too. Sleep is another one that's really big for me so um yeah so those are my quick my go-to's when you know I feel like I I need to up up the happiness ante a little bit in terms of my practices well I definitely am inspired to add more to my arsenal my (laughs) my go-to for the pandemic was I started doing puzzles and I mean there was something great about that too because it just makes you stop and concentrate and we don't it's just gives your brain a break, but um, totally. And I think, you know, one of the reasons I love puzzles is, you know, they're, they're partly very mindful and so on, but, but they're also something that if you pay attention, like builds you up rather than, you know, drops you down. I think that was another kind of lesson that we learned in the pandemic was that a lot of us had the time to notice like, Oh, these things feel good. These are non-negotiables. Maybe I added more time with my family or maybe I took time to take a walk with the dog and just be present. Or I just did a puzzle, you know, took a half hour to do a puzzle. I think when you learn that there are things that really do make you feel good, you need to build those into your schedule too. Well, thank you so much. I wanted just to wrap up to ask one final question about um, the future of science um, in this field and in thinking about, um, Ha- the science of happiness do you see as you you know think about um, your class next semester and as you think about you know your continued work um, as a cognitive scientist do you see any trends that you're looking forward to diving into in the next several years yeah I mean I think there I'll say you know one area I think that's really exciting and then one kind of you know way to continue this practice of teaching this content which I also find really exciting but I think a domain that a lot of folks are interested in now um, which of course really resonates here at Providence college is the importance of spiritual experiences uh, for happiness mm-hmm. um, you know there's a lot more really reflective work on you know what kind of causes us to transform and really pay attention to what matters in life and the meaning in life um, and I think more and more kind of researchers are starting to look at the role that spiritual experiences play but also other transformative experiences um, for example there's a lot of work right now on the potential therapeutic benefits of things like psychedelic drugs which mm. which functionally get back to the kinds of 
transformative experiences that were described, you know, in the Bible by religious leaders, you know, for hundreds of years. And so I think there's some really exciting new work in these domains trying to figure out, okay, you know, what do, how do we get these experiences, you know, whether through religious practices, contemplative practices, or through, you know, chemical interventions, basically, and, and what are some of the benefits, right? Like, how does it really change us over time? And so I think there's, you know, so in the next 10, 20 years, we'll see some really exciting work in that domain. Um, but in terms of my next steps, we're kind of, you know, sharing this stuff. Um, you know, we're excited with our new high school class, but, you know, really, I want to get this content out there to even younger students. Mm. Um, and so I've just started up a partnership with uh, Sesame Workshop, which is the group that makes Sesame Street. Very um, fun. <laughs> yes, very fun. I actually just got back this week from a big photo shoot with a bunch of uh, Muppets. I posed oh. with Big Bird and Elmo, which was very fun. Very cool. Um, but yeah, the idea is, like, you know, what if we could just teach a lot of these strategies to, you know, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, six-year-olds, right? Because I think a lot of the practices we talk about, you know, they, they are based on the science, but it's not like rocket science, right? These are just simple strategies and hacks that even little kids can do. And so I'm really interested in ways that we can get parents to understand that these strategies are ones that we should be teaching our kids as early as possible um, and to try to get that content out there as much as we can. That's terrific. I can't wait to um, see that emerge. Yeah, stay tuned for yeah. the Happiness Lab with me and Elmo. <laughs> oh, so I'm coming soon. Awesome. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for being here on the Providence Pol- College podcast. And um, it's just been a joy to have you back in Providence. And that's all for today's edition of the Providence College podcast. Along with our producer, Chris Judge, thank you for listening. We're happy you did.